Hi YouTube and welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about the challenges in modern data pipelines, how Snowflake has evolved to overcome these challenges and make it easier for data engineers like yourself to implement data pipelines. But crucially, at the end of the video, if you stay tuned, um, I'll cover off what the role of DBT is then, because I've seen some um, some posts and some some uh, comments recently around uh, if Snowflake is able to do um, decorative pipelines um, similar to DBT models, then what is the purpose of DBT? Now that's the initial obvious kind of conclusion to jump to, but I do think DBT has a lot of additional features to add um, and it's not necessarily a straight like for like comparison. So I hope you find this video useful. Okay, so before we get into the specifics around Snowflake and then look at DBT, I just wanted to start off a couple of um, pages as a bit of a, a revision, or if you're new to building data pipelines, what they, uh, how they've evolved, what they need to do, and then move on to some of the challenges before looking at how Snowflake and DBT kind of address these, ch these problems. So with modern data pipelines now, there's a general shift towards automation. How can we reduce the maintenance overhead and the expense and cost of creating and developing and maintaining data pipelines? So automation is everything, and that goes right the way through from the taking a requirement, building the initial code, automatically deploying that to a development or test environment, automatically running those tests and getting early feedback on it should be part of that process as well. Um, that uh, more holistically is known as CICD, um, a huge wealth of information out there in the public domain um, and not something I'm going to cover in this video. But essentially, automation is, is where the, the move is, uh, is heading with regards to pipelines. There needs to be a reduction in complexity and expense. So to create data pipelines, it involves engineering effort. And there's a number of challenges which we'll touch upon on the next page. But it is complex and uh, or and it can get very complex to do things in the most efficient way possible. So it's how, how do we remove this complexity? How do we remove the manual overhead and the challenges of building data pipelines, which historically have always been around? With these two things in mind, then there's been a shift to declarative pipelines, essentially writing SQL code that will create a pipeline and apply transformations on the fly. There's a lot of benefits to this. Um, the first one is it, it, it saves data engineers having to create and maintain their own database objects. Alongside that is the DML code that needs to uh, create tables, views, etc. cetera. Um, and it allows then the removal of this kind of manual intervention and overhead really allows for a real focus on business value. So getting that data um, through your architecture, through the layers in your, in your data warehouse, applying the business logic and transformations, getting that into the hands of the end users so there can be a real emphasis and focus on spending your time, not building and testing data pipelines, but really add intangible business value. So what are some of the key challenges to call out with, uh, with data pipelines? And I've just summarized these to what I think are the major ones that I've seen in my experience. Now, often when new data is arriving, either um, near real time, intraday or in batch, it's a lot easier and less complicated just to do a full refresh. Some people call this a truncate and reload, but essentially you're removing all the data out of your target tables and repopulating, repopulating that data with everything from your source table, regardless of what has changed. So even if just 10% of your source table data has changed, you're reloading all 100% every single time. It reduces complexity because you don't need to worry about um, identifying those new records, which we'll come to on the next point. It also allows you to apply a consistent set of transformations over the top every single time that data is reloaded. So if your transformations or business logic changes in the future, you can just simply just blow away your target table and reload it and the next time your data is all up to date and in sync. The more your data grows, however, the longer this process takes to run, the more expensive it is to run at scale. So really, this option is only um, applicable for small scale environments and really you're sitting on a problem that's waiting to to come up and, and bite you at some stage where you need you need to address it and make it more efficient so that often leads people 
um, either at the outset if they know, if they know they're going to be dealing with large uh, volumes and working at scale or if they start with full refresh and I move to this later they look to do an incremental refresh there's a number of strategies around this um, might save that for another video but again um, lots of stuff out there on that now incremental refresh means 10% of your source data is changing you only want to bring in that 10% of data apply your business logic to it and then merge those changes into your target table seamlessly and um, number one it's much more efficient doing that so it's cheaper and uh, quicker to get that data through the pipeline and make it available to your data consumers however it does add complexity you need to be able to understand and easily and, and reliably identify what changes have been made in your source data so you can pick those up apply that logic to just your deltas as they're known and merge those into your target table so it does add a layer of complexity especially then if that logic needs to change in the future or if you need to add additional fields or columns um, to your target table that you haven't necessarily populated previously all of that is much more difficult in this world finally then the other key channel challenge i'll call out is around dependency management orchestration so some tasks within your data pipelines can and should run in parallel if they're not dependent on each other and make really good use of the the compute available to you certainly in a modern cloud data platform um, but in other circumstances certain tables will have to be loaded in a sequence so for example you may need to land your data up front before loading your dimensions and then loading your facts if you're following a Kimball style star schema model um, and then what do you do if something fails upstream so what do you do if a if a table fails and you've got downstream tables depending on that how do you manage that and often that involves adding code and more complexity into your data pipeline to to deal with that sort of hand in hand with that is orchestration what runs when how do you trigger certain loads how do you identify if there's been a failure do you stop all the loads do you continue some loads do you roll stuff back so again a lot of um a lot of questions that need to be answered in terms of developing a modern data pipeline here okay so snowflakes approach so we'll start up here and this is the let's call it the old way of doing it although it's still available to everybody but let's just call it the old way for now because initially this was the way just using snowflakes native out of the box capabilities of how you could um, build a data pipeline um, in snowflake so let's say we've got two base tables a and b we've got data arriving in here from our source systems this is all within snowflake previously we'd have to set up a, a stream object and i'll put a link in the banner above now if you want to know about these objects called streams and tasks so i'm going to set up a stream against each of these source tables and what this is going to do this is going to work behind the scenes and identify what those deltas are so there's inserts and updates and deletes to these table tables and it's going to keep a, a ledger of those in a log so we've got inserts updates and deletes and there's various options that you can add in when you're setting up these streams depending on your use case and what you want to see but the most basic thing is this this is allowing you to identify the changes in both your source tables now you've got these ledgers set up how do you get these changes into your target table over here and make it available to your end users or applications well you would set up what's called a task in snowflake a task is essentially a piece of SQL code or a SQL statement that can run um, the initial parent task has to be built upon a CRUD style schedule so it needs to kick off at a certain um, time child tasks which can be um, chained to this parent task can be executed um, on the basis of this being successful or failure or however so working on the most basic principle let's say we've got a task it runs every day at a certain time this task can have a bit of SQL code in there that picks up the changes from these stream log tables and it uses a SQL merge statement for example to merge those incremental changes into the target table so let's see these are your existing records and then we might apply our updates and inserts and delete 
um, against our target table here. So quite a few things that you need to do as a data engineer to set up this pipeline. You're gonna to have to create different streams. You're gonna to have to manage those, make sure they're up and running and working. Um, and then you're gonna to have to create a task and schedule that, make sure that's running and create your SQL merge statement to effectively merge those changes in. So that was the original way of doing it. There's now a new way. And it doesn't mean that this, this approach is now not valid. Um, the new approach using declarative data pipelines, what Snowflake called dynamic tables, is really being designed for um, near real-time low latency use cases in many respects. Um, but it can be used for, for um, data refreshes on a longer frequency um, because it does remove a lot of this complexity as we'll see in a second. So now um, we've got our changes coming into our base tables again, base table A and base, base table B. This time though, all we need is our dynamic table. And this is effectively a SQL statement. And we specify a lag time, which can go down to one minute. This SQL statement basically tells Snowflake what our target table structure needs to look like, as well as join and data from these two tables together. Now, notice that we don't need a stream anymore because the dynamic table in the background is automatically working out what's changed based upon the SQL statement it's got here. So if the underlying data has changed, it will recognize that and just bring in the new data that's available. So we don't need streams anymore. We don't need a task anymore because we've got this lag time, which specifies and tells Snowflake how frequently we want to refresh this dynamic table. So if we refresh it every one minute, this is going to look for any changes in that previous minute, execute the refresh, and the table is available for your end users. Now it's looking at this approach where people instinctively go, well, why do I need dbt anymore? Because in dbt, you're using SQL statements predominantly um, to create your dbt models which is essentially the same as creating a dynamic table or a decorative output. So let's look at dbt. So where does this play into things now? Well, look, it's absolutely right that and obvious that people will draw immediate parallels to dynamic tables and dbt because of the nature of the way it works, which I've just explained. However, there's a lot more to dbt than just creating models and decorative pipelines. And dbt actually addresses some of those issues and, and challenges that we spoke about a little earlier. And the first one is, uh, integration with version control. And this is important, let's put CICD here. This is important for the reasons I mentioned earlier, the shift towards automation, the trying to get um, early feedback and deploying code to um, dev or test environments, running our pipelines, getting early feedback on code that's, that's been, been or about to be promoted to production is crucially important. The integration and the tight integration that dbt has with GitHub and Bitbucket um, is far better and more mature than Snowflake. Snowflake is evolving in this space but again, customers that just have Snowflake and don't have dbt, um, they may want to um, bring in CICD style principles. Most of my customers then are looking at products like Terraform, Schema Change, Flyway, a combination of different products outside of Snowflake um, to make that reality. Whereas if you've got dbt and your codes managed within there, then this is far easier to start, start off with. Um, linked to that is automated testing. And I'll put a link in the banner above where I went through this in dbt uh, on a different video. But dbt out of the box allows you to run what's called generic tests, very simply and very easily as part of the YAML configuration files. Um, and you can also do customized tests as well. So essentially anything that you can write in SQL. This goes hand in hand with this because when you deploy your data pipelines and you run code through that, Invariably, you want to run testing against it. You want to avoid doing that manually because that's expensive and involves uh, users and in, in their time. 
So you can then trigger some tests, have dbt execute those tests as part of that deployment process, and then you get your feedback to your data engineers. So another important point there. Um, there's also automated documentation. So because dbt knows how your um, models are set up, where the data is coming from, um, and how it's transformed and what jobs link to what other jobs, what models are dependent on others. And this goes back to the orchestration uh, dependency point, which I'm gonna cover in the next point. Um, it makes it really easy then for dbt to produce documentation based upon what it knows about and what you've put into that dbt project. Something that Snowflake doesn't necessarily care for at the moment. Um, my fourth and final point, and there's gonna be others, and if there are others, um, well, there definitely is others, but these are the key ones in my experience. But if there are others, pop them in the comments below to help other people out, we much appreciate it. Um, the other one then is around dependency management and orchestration. So dependencies. And dbt will handle these dependencies for you because of the nature of the way that you're um, linking these models together, using some Jinja um, functions within your dbt models. Um, it knows how each model is linked to each other. Therefore, it knows what models need to be populated and in what order. You can then also um, change or customize the behavior to say, if this particular model fails here, I don't want to stop everything and I don't want to run anything else subsequent to that. Um, and so it gives you really good um, degree of um, automation around those dependencies and orchestration because it's managed for you. If you're adding new jobs in the middle of your pipeline, which will depend on others, you don't need to go in and manually change stuff around. Um, it's not so simple and straightforward with any of the native out of the box tool and with Snowflake that we looked at previously. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, that is the modern data pipelines, uh, the, the, the shift where it's going generally over the last few years and will continue to do so. The challenges that um, these vendors need to help you as data engineers overcome um, how Snowflake's evolving in this space, moving away from streams and tasks and providing different options for low latency stuff. DBT, however, still has a really important place to, to play, I would say, with more um, a broader set of capabilities, which are certainly complementary to Snowflake. And I would also say that your dynamic tables are very much focused on low latency use cases, so getting that data through very quickly to your end users, where DBT is more preferable memories for those batch intraday ones. Doesn't mean that it can't do near real time, it just plays in a, in a different space. Um, more broadly than that, I see dbt used a lot um, for what dbt calls analytics engineers, where you really want data democratization. Um, those people out in the business units may not necessarily be um, specialist ETL tool users and so on, um, but they may have good SQL skills and you can give them dbt and they can maybe create their own environments. Probably another topic for a different video, but in the meantime, I hope you found that video useful. If you did, keep watching, keep subscribing. New videos come in very soon.